Good morning. I'm Nigel Forster, landscape photographer with Photo Training for You. Today we're going to go over uh, camera controls and settings, which are ideal for landscape photography. As you can tell, we're in a wonderful part of the Brecon Beacons, a place called Talibont Reservoir. We're right at the dam, at the head of the reservoir, surrounded by fantastic mountains. And as you can tell, we've got a, a really good day for landscape photography as well. Sunshine and showers. Hopefully the showers aren't going to affect us too much. Um, I've got an umbrella with me, uh, just in case. And in fact, the car's just down the, down the road in case we need to dive into it. But hopefully we'll, all will go to plan. Um, as you can tell, I've got a Nikon D700. Uh, it's got a 16 to 35 wide angle lens with us. I'm going to stick with this scene that the camera's pointed at at the moment uh, to talk you through the settings. And I'm going to talk to you through the whole range of settings, right from the metering options, the focusing options, and the other controls that it's essential for the image. One thing that's po worth pointing out, I do keep them fairly simple, because the priority for me is on the image making side of it. It's actually on the composition, how I'm going to get the best out of the camera, not complicate matters by using a, a wide range of complex settings. So hopefully you'll pick up one or two tips from that. Now, as I explained, I've got a Nikon D700 here. Um, obviously, many of you will have not only other Nikon makes, but also other makes, primarily Canon, of which uh, I know from the courses I teach uh, an, a considerable number of, of people possess. Now, as I explained for the moment, we're going to be using the uh, Nikon D700 to, to explain the key controls. Um, so, starting really from the, uh, the primary controls downwards, um, the uh, exposure metering method you can use. Um, this one has got uh, spot metering, um, matrix metering, or Nikon call it matrix metering, Canon call it evaluative metering. Canon uses a different language for most of the controls, by the way, so get used to this. Um, and there's also center weight of metering. Canon also have partial metering. Um, now, for landscape work, I largely use spot metering for two reasons. Um, firstly, um, I like to know exactly where I'm taping, taking my metering from so I can measure precisely the tone of the camera. Now, in another video, we're going to be going through how the camera reads exposure. Um, it doesn't read black, it doesn't read white. It reads something called 18% grey. Now, the closest you can estimate to that 18% grey will maximise your ability to expose most accurately. Um, spot metering will allow you to do that. So that's the primary reason I use spot metering. The second reason is related to focusing. On the majority of uh, certainly professional cameras uh, or high-end cameras, and indeed some of the mid-range um, amateur models as well, uh, the spot meter will also be related to your single focus point tracker, which is another, another setting I also use. Now on this camera, the focus point tracker options are the one, the button at the bottom there. Um, at the moment, as you can tell, I've got it on the single focus point. Therefore, you can pick on the scene, the key focus point you want to concentrate on, but it will also measure exposure as well. It's a very, very useful tool, particularly when you've got the camera on a tripod. Now, I know many of, that, many of you out there will probably be used to um, focusing on a key part of the scene and perhaps repositioning. So you've got the focus point in the middle, but, and then you'll reposition to the part of the scene you want to expose for. However, on a tripod, that's much, much more difficult because you then have to effectively recompose the whole camera. So on a tripod, I would always recommend use spot metering with single focus point tracker, and then you're performing two functions at the same time. I'm also going to use manual exposure as well. Now, I know that many of you will probably be used to using perhaps um, aperture priority, shutter priority, <laughs> to Canon use of such time value, by the way. Um, and, um, but I prefer to use manual exposure because I, to my mind, the more control you have um, of the camera in landscape photography, uh, the better the results and the better the more accurate results can be. With exposure in particular, um, precision is important. Um, now, of course, in one of the others, aperture or shutter priority, you can use exposure compensation to compensate when the camera's measured the exposure from uh, the scene incorrectly. My argument is, why not use manual and make your own assessment? My, the important thing from my point of view is to measure most accurately from that mid-gray I talked about, the 18% gray. Now, my assessment of this scene, a, a lit landscape, 
would be an accurate point of uh, exposure. Uh, the light water, the light part of the sky, but not the white clouds. The white clouds are going to be too bright. They will underexpose the picture if you point to the white clouds. Obviously, in this, uh, <laughs> increasing the sun is coming around, which I know, having discussed it at length with Sam, is causing us a few issues here. Um, but um, uh, a very bright part of the picture will give an ina inaccurate exposure. So as a starting point, I will look for that 18% grey and take my exposure reading off that and use that. Now, you can see from the scene we've got in front of us that the sky is brighter than the water. That will normally be the case, by and large, in a scene like this, particularly when the sun's behind clouds. The sky is the same brightness, but the landscape becomes darker. So there's clearly a difference between the two. Now, in a separate video, I'm going to show you one of the ways you can, or two or three of the ways that you can overcome that. For, but, but for the purposes of this one, I'm going to keep it a single exposure. But you will notice that either that foreground will be underexposed or the sky will be overexposed because of the imbalance between the two. Next important setting to uh, make sure, shooting in RAW. Um, to those of you who are shooting in JPEGs, um, related to what I've just mentioned, um, um, your image will have a very wide range of exposure, what they call dynamic range. Um, you need to be as flexible as possible to cater for that. Now, RAW, of course, will do that. A JPEG, which is, a, is effectively a process compressed image, what the camera's done is effectively looks at the scene in front of it, um, chucked out about two thirds of the information and given you its perfect result. Unfortunately, in giving you its perfect result, sometimes less than perfect, it's chucked out important data, which you then cannot process afterwards. A RAW file contains an, a lot of embedded information which you can then bring out through post-processing. Absolutely vital in landscape photography and absolutely vital in high contrast scenes such as this. So I always have my camera on RAW. By the way, for those of you who want instant JPEGs, you've always got the option of having a RAW plus J JPEG setting in the quality controls in your camera as well. Um, the uh, quality on my camera, <laughs> not easy to see actually because it's on the dial at the top. Um, uh, I can go through the menu, but I, again, I prefer not to. Um, ISO, if we look at um, the ISO setting, you'll see I've got it. Uh, Nikon call it 1.0, it's actually 100 ISO. That's the lowest ISO setting, which usually I would use for landscape photography. Don't forget with ISO, the higher you go, it, the sensor will respond to light more quickly, and you can use, take images in low light. Professional level cameras will be pretty good at, at reducing image noise. The amateur level cameras, um, the, particularly on the crop frame, much less so, although they are getting better. Uh, you would certainly notice if you're used to using 1600 ISO or above, massive degradation in image quality, what they call image noise, lots of it. If you can avoid it, all, or that, all for the better. So I always use the lowest ISO I, can, I possibly can. Um, white balance. Uh, again, my white balance the buttons at the top as well. For landscape photography, I usually use auto white balance. Um, it does a pretty good job by and, by and large. Your camera will have a whole range of settings from the indoor artificial lighting settings uh, to uh, a mix of sunny day, cloudy, um, and a whole range of settings. Now, as you can see here, we've got rapidly changing light. One minute it's cloudy, one minute it's sunny. I prefer let, to let the camera do the job. There are exceptions to this. Um, for example, with panoramic photo merges, where while you're panning, you can actually get a change in the reading, which can cause all sorts of problems when you're trying to merge the images. But we'll come on to that on another, on another, another day. So usually, I, I trust my camera's auto white balance setting. I know some people prefer to use a fixed setting like Cloudy Day. Uh, you'll find that comes out very warm if you don't actually need it. Of course, white balance is one of those things easily uh, correctable in either Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. So again, it's not something to worry too much about. And as you can tell, just while I've been talking, the sun's come back out again. I mentioned a minute ago um, where we've got a big difference in exposure readings between the water and the sky. Now, that will reduce. The sun's just come out. That exposure difference between the water and the sky actually is less than it was. But when there is a difference, and there's still going to be a stop or two difference, um, the, um, one of the ways in which you can uh, correct that 
is to take more than one exposure and blend them. So I will often set the camera to the bracketing uh, setting and just take three images consecutively, immediately after each other, and blend the sky to the landscape from the top and the bottom to balance the exposure. Now, I told you it was quite straightforward. Those are actually the key settings on the camera that you'll use. One thing I did forget to mention, though, just a minute ago, in using bracketing, using the rapid fire uh, option at the same time, because that takes the images immediately after each other. You don't want the scene to change if you're taking the trouble to take them manually one after another. So you'll take one, two, three, immediately after each other. So I did forget to mention that. So yeah, apart from that, those are actually the most important settings. You're using spot metering, you're using the single focus point to measure where you're focusing on precisely, which as I explained, will also use the spot metering. You're using the lowest ISO you can, Using auto white balance, but that is an option. I'll leave that one up to you. My preference is to use auto white balance. Um, I like control over my bracketing options. Um, I use manual, manual exposure because I like to have control over metering. Um, and as I explained, the most important thing is to have maximum control over the image you're taking and to keep things simple. Don't get too worried about all these very, very complicated settings which all modern cameras have got. Uh, a multitude of focusing settings which actually you don't need. It is about having control over the image, the part of the image you want to focus on and expose correctly. And then you can concentrate on the important things like composition. Um, the first picture I'm going to take, I'm going to expose for the water, the light area of water. Now what that will almost certainly do is to overexpose the sky. So I'm going to take a second image exposing for the sky. You'll see they'll be quite different but I'll get the water detail and the cloud detail. You'll also notice that the darkest part of the image is the tower. Now, I would expect that my exposure for the water will also render me sufficient detail in raw for the tower as well. If I just took exposure for the sky, I wouldn't stand a chance. That tower would be far too dark. I'd almost certainly underexpose it massively. And as you can tell, the sun's come right out again. And as we, every minute we talk, the sun's coming further around. So I think I probably better get on with it. So uh, first picture I'm going to take now. Now, uh, you'll be able to see that the sky is massively overexposed. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to move my focus point tracker up. It's going to focus on the sky in theory, of course, but uh, in, fa in reality, it's an infinity. But as I mentioned, it's also going to measure the exposure as well. So I'm now going to take an image exposing for the sky. Now, there was actually two and a half stops difference there. First image I took was at a hundredth of a second at f13. Second image was uh, at five hundredth of a second at f13. That was at 100 ISO, by the way. So there were two and a half stops difference there. It's possibly markedly different than it looks to the naked eye. Uh, you wouldn't have thought that's that much difference, but it's a fair amount. Um, in a later video, I'm going to show you one of the other ways you can overcome that by using a graduated filter to, uh, to balance the two out. Now, the exposure, the third exposure I'm going to do, just to cover myself, is for the tower and see how much darker that tower is than the water. We measured the water at 100 ISO. In saying this, I am absolutely fully aware that the sun is coming in and out and constantly changing. So. When I'm talking about the exposure readings I'm using, just bear that in mind. Uh, right, I've just taken a third picture because I was concerned that I needed sufficient detail in the tower, and that's shown as being a 40th of a second at f13. So what I've done, I've taken three images, um, a 40th of a second to a 500th of a second. That's about, on my calculation, about five stops difference between the darkest tones and the lightest tones in the picture. And it's that kind of range that you, can, that, that you will need to get all the tones measured in that image. The other thing I probably need to explain is, um, is uh, depth of field. Now, I've mentioned I've used, on more than one occasion, I've used a single focus point tracker. Um, now, I also used F13. Now, in reality, I've got a wide-angle lens on here. 
it's at 16 millimeters, which is equivalent to 10 millimeters on a crop frame camera. Um, and in reality, everything I was focusing on, the tower, the water, the sky, um, is an infinity. So it doesn't really matter. I used F13. Um, lenses tend to perform pretty well at those mid-range uh, of, um, of apertures, f-stops. Um, now, obviously, if I had a, a part of the image, for example, the wall you can see in the foreground, if I had that in the foreground, the focusing would therefore become critical because I'd need to think about depth of field. In other words, having all of the picture in focus, if that's what I wanted. As it is, my subjects within this image were the tower and its railings, the water, the background scenery and the sky. Effectively, on a 16 millimeter lens, all in infinity. So I really didn't have to worry in, about the aperture in terms of control of depth of field. But in other videos, I will show you examples in which that control is really important because depth of field is dependent on three things. Firstly, it's dependent on the aperture you use. You've got more control. Don't forget the smaller the hole, the smaller the aperture, the wider the depth of field. Uh, but also the closeness you are away from the subject to the subject, beg your pardon, um, the closer you are, you are to a subject and the furthest away that your furthest subject are, the more depth of field becomes critical. Um, the lens that you're using, telephoto lenses have got a narrower depth of field than a wide angle lens. Therefore, in a lens like this, I'm pretty confident I can get that whole scene in focus. So in this respect, I was primarily using that focus point tracker to measure the exposure and not necessarily too worried about its role as focusing. Okay, that's it. Um, you'll probably think that's quite simple. That's because it is. I do like to keep things simple. They're the controls I usually use for my landscape photography. Um, you'll know that your cameras have got a massive amount of options in terms of shooting modes, uh, exposure modes, focusing modes in particular can be incredibly complicated, but I keep things simple because my priority is getting an effective image. Therefore, the most of my time is spent on composition and making the picture. So I like to make sure I'm familiar with those settings, use them regularly, know where to turn to, and don't overcomplicate things. And I, I would suggest you try and do the same. So um, that's it, really. I'm not going to go over the, um, the settings in, uh, in detail again. I think I've done that more than one occasion. But um, the simple rule is, Keep things simple, let the camera do the work. This is Nigel Forster, landscape photographer for Photo Training for you. See you again soon. Thanks very much. Goodbye.